Hello, Maths fans. Welcome to the final lecture in the Maths fans online lecture series. And today you have the joy, I hope, of listening to me doing a talk. So I have decided, in my own fictional world at least, that Pikachu is a diva. As you might expect, given all the attention that Pikachu would get. So Pikachu is a bit of a diva, so I'm going to bring Pikachu back down to Earth because I'm going to use my Pikachu, or plural Pikachus, to power the light bulbs in my house. It's an electric Pokemon. It therefore has electricity. I'm going to use it as a source of electricity and power to power my house, power my light bulbs. So we're going to ask the question, how many Pikachus would it take to power a light bulb? Which of the three Pokemon would you like to try to catch? And at this point, just pick whichever one you think looks cool. The middle one? The middle one. You want to try and catch Eevee? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to try and catch Eevee. Now the catch rate of Eevee, this is important, is 45. Okay, is so you it need the to hardest? That is the hardest, yes. <laughs> okay. So the catch rate of Eevee is 45. So remember in stage one, we need our randomly generated number to be less than 45 before we can progress to stage two. So the way this is going to work is you need to pick which ball you're going to use. Now, obviously, you, which one, which, if I gave you free choice, which one are you going to pick? The yellow one. Good, you're going to pick the Ultra Ball because it gives you the shortest range for your random numbers. However, I have all three in this bag and you are going to pick one. I'm not going to make it too easy. So if you just stick your hand in, grab one of those. Okay, so unfortunately, <laughs> you have the Pokeball, which is the worst one. the soundtrack to my childhood right there. We have a full tree of life um, for the Pokemon world. It's very interesting. I mean, as you would expect, all the leaf type are together, all the like ghost type are together, because obviously the type of the Pokemon is gonna be quite an important characteristic in grouping it together. Um, all of the quite humanoid creatures are on the right, which sort of makes sense. Um, we also discover from this that life in the Pokemon world also started in the water which is interesting. Same, again, the model itself is built to do Earth, so it makes sense that it would sort of implicitly have a bias towards life starting in water, but you find the same for the Pokemon world. Um, but a final question and a final thought that I will put out to you all is, what was the starting Pokemon at the base? It's not quite at the base, but it would be like the furthest back on the Pokemon tree of life. Where did all life in the Pokemon world come from. You can't see on the screen because <laughs> that would be too much of a giveaway. But where did all life in the Pokemon world come from? Welcome to the next lecture in the Maths Fans online lecture series. Today it is my great pleasure to introduce Rob Easterway, the author of 14 books, which is incredibly impressive, uh, including the one I remember reading when I was an undergraduate, Why Do Buses Come in Threes? This is sort of semi-based on a true story uh, about a very rich guy called Am Very Rich, who uh, had a boat that he kept in the Mediterranean. Very nice, expensive boat. Uh, and it was in this sort of uh, isolated dock, uh, tied with a piece of rope to the quay here. But um, accidentally, he'd left it um, with very slack rope. So there was a danger if there was any wind and so on, it would buff it around. The rope would shorten and lengthen and so on. Um, uh, and he heard that there was a storm coming to the Mediterranean, so he thought, I'd better uh, get my uh, assistant to go and fix this. So here's uh, the, the boat. When the, when the rope was completely taut, the boat was a metre away from the quay. So here's uh, I'm very rich's assistant, whose name is Benolin Chestikov. OK, and he, um, he decided, uh, OK, I'm going to pull the boat in. And what I'll do is I'll pull it in by one metre. I'll shorten by one metre, okay? Because that will pull the boat in. So here's the question, it's a very straightforward question. Will the boat make it as far as the quay or not? Yes or no? Uh, you can uh, discuss that briefly with your neighbour, see if you agree with uh, their answer. And um, I will take a, take a vote. Pascal's triangle. Um, if you've never encountered this lovely triangle, it's made up of numbers and it starts with one at the top, then one, one, 
one, two, one, and each row is made by just, each number is the sum of the two numbers above it, left, above, right. Of course, the ones on the end only have a one up from them, but the next row is gonna be one, three, three, one, and then one at the end, four, six, four, one, and so on. This is what it looks like down to 10 rows. Now, Pascal's triangle is so easy to build, but what's amazing is it has got lots of beautiful properties buried within it, lots of patterns. For example, if you add up the rows, they add up to one, two, four, eight, sixteen, the powers of two. How beautiful that this is embedded within Pascal's triangle. Um, but uh, there's other things to be found. For example, one, three, six, ten, fifteen, these are the triangle numbers, or the snooker ball numbers, as I like to call them. Um, and you can find things like the Fibonacci sequence and so on. everything seems to be buried within Pascal's triangle. But I want to raise something rather different, which is, may seem more boring, some of the numbers are odd and some of the numbers are even. Now here's my question. I want you to imagine a billion rows of Pascal's triangle. And another multiple choice for you. In Pascal's triangle, with a billion rows, what proportion of the numbers to the nearest percentage will be odd? Will it be two thirds, 67%, 50%, 33%, 25% or 0%, okay? So a choice of five this time. Hello maths fans, welcome to the next lecture in the online lecture series for maths fans. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Sophie McLean, who is a PhD student working on analytic number theory at King's College London. Good job I had the slide there to remind me. So actually, I'm gonna start by asking you all at home um, and in the audience here a question. I want you to answer how many households in the UK you think have a pet. So if you're in a room, have a think. If you're at home, write your answer down, grab a piece of paper. And we're talking specifically about households. Um, not number of people, not number of pets. How many households in the UK do you think have a pet? Now, there is one common question every time I talk to people about money uh, that they say, which is, what if I don't care? Um, and that's a very valid question, because as a confession, I don't really care. Um, but to prove my point that this is useful for all of life, um, I'm gonna give you all a challenge. So again, at home, have a think. One of these graphs is a stock price. Exactly one of them. I want you to think which one. I'm gonna show you a very real equation that is used by uh, traders worldwide um, to work out the price of a certain product. Um, so this is what it looks like. Now, again, I don't expect you to understand this, but I just wanna show you an example of how all this can come together. Because we've got our current price like we were talking about. This is the S. Um, this mu is the expected value. We've got time, we've got the volatility and the Brownian motion. And they can all come together to form an idea of the price of a particular financial product, in this case, an option, which we're not getting into, but it's something related to a stock. Um, and we can have similar things for stocks as well. So we can create our model, we can use our probabilities, and we can work out what we would expect the price of a stock or a share to be in the future. Right. Can we trade now? We've, we've got our probabilities. Done. Those watching our watches are gonna be like, no, we're not done, Sophie. I know, I know this talk goes on for a little bit longer. Um, there are some problems. This rounds up my advice on trading. Um, firstly, of my tips was to use the probabilities. Work out what you think is gonna happen in the future. Allow for uncertainty. And finally, know your opponent Think about other people around you. And although that was advice for trading, really, it's my general advice for life. Today, the first speaker in the Maths Fan online lecture series, which is what we are calling this event, is uh, Dr. Simon Clark, and has recently passed 500,000 YouTube subscribers. So congratulations from one YouTuber to another. That is awesome. <laughs> well done, Simon. And I want to set the scene because this is a story about me and one equation. And if you were to go back in time to 2017 and the small garden of a terrace student house, you will have seen a young me putting printouts of computer code into a tiny barbecue. And then once the entire program had been added 
to the barbecue, sift through the ashes, let them cool, and I rub the ashes of my defeated foe on my face. Because this was a computer program that I had been debugging for 18 months of my PhD. This ruined my life for almost my, half my PhD. And what I want to talk about in this talk is what led me to this, this man to this moment of madness. What could possibly have brought me to this mental state? And the answer is an equation. It's this equation. In this talk, I want to talk about what this equation means, where we get it from, what I was trying to do with it, and why I found it so difficult to solve. So this is the equation that ruined my life. This is what it looks like in the velocity field. Uh, I believe this is a slightly different year, but these events are often quite similar. So you start out with a polar vortex that looks, well, vortex-like, about the size of Asia, and then it kind of splits into two vortices. There you go. It forms, and then the whole circulation over the course of a couple of days just completely shreds itself, and the biggest storm on Earth basically deletes itself. This is what we call a sudden stratospheric warming. That name may not be particularly obvious until you look at the temperature field. So this is exactly the same event, but instead of looking at the wind speed, you're looking at the temperature. So you see, for example, that it's about minus 70 in the, in the, over the Arctic in the stratosphere most of the time. But if you play the same event, you've got perhaps minus 70 or whatever going to maybe minus 50 in the mid-latitudes. Keep an eye here in the middle. The temperature field massively increases when the vortex splits apart. So it's a warming of 60, 70 degrees over the course of literally a couple of days. When we first discovered these in the 1950s, we actually called them explosive warmings, which is a much better name in my opinion. Um, unfortunately, we ended up with sudden, which makes it somehow seem a bit less dramatic. But that obviously, if you're warming a section of the atmosphere by 70 degrees over a couple of days, that has huge implications for the rest of the atmosphere and the weather we experience. Welcome back to the Maths Fan Online Lecture Series, where today we are joined by Dr. James Grime. If you are a frequent consumer of maths online content, you are more likely to recognize him as the face of number file, particularly in those early days, uh, where he has now done, we've just, we figured out as more than 100. Well, yeah, Several hundred. Somewhere like 100, maybe 200, maybe 300. <laughs> Who's counting? <laughs> we, we could, of course, have counted this. Please do count and tell us. Uh, he has done many hundreds of videos on number files. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing him live, as I'm sure all of you are. Got a little bit of video here to show you. So this is uh, a World War II Enigma machine. This is an army Enigma machine. It's actually used in World War II. It looks like this. So it's a beautiful looking machine for a start. It's 1940s styling. So it's all black and silver highlights, beautiful, right? Uh, you might notice it's not a QWERTY keyboard. It's a QWERTS keyboard, it's a German keyboard, but otherwise it's like a typewriter. Uh, let's try it out. So I'm gonna type a message in this. Should be something in German, but I'm gonna keep it easy. I'm just gonna say hello to you, right? So I'm gonna type hello into this machine. So I'm gonna type H first. You'll notice there's two sets of letters and you're gonna see why there's two sets of letters. So if I press H first, so hello is my message. If I press that and then Z lights up like that. That's your code lighting up. So the code lights up like this, but I'm gonna do the whole word. So hello was the word. So if I do E next for hello, there's Y lighting up. Now I'm gonna do L next. So if I press L, I've got I lighting up. If I do the second L in hello, if I press that, I get Y again, R, right, well. And then let's finish this, let's do the O in hello. So I press O and there you go, that's the X lighting up. Now, that by the way doesn't transmit, right? It never did transmit. Someone has to stand next to you, sort of looking over your shoulder. They're writing down the code letters on a piece of paper. They then give that to a radio operator who transmits the code, right? By Morse code, it travels, right? So it goes far away. Now you may have noticed something weird about that code. Did you notice something weird? Right? There was a couple of weird things that happened. And this was the year that he decided to take on one of the great unsolved problems in maths at that time. It was something called the decision problem. It was set by a German mathematician called David Hilbert. So his, what he did is he set out a series of problems as challenges for 20th century mathematicians. And one of these problems, called the decision problem, 
I'm going to try and give you the gist of this. There are going to be people here who know a lot more about this than me. I'm going to try and give you the gist of this idea. So the question he had was, is there some sort of single method that we can use, single mathematical method that could uh, answer any mathematical question we give it? So if we give it a question, it can tell me true or false. Or if I give it a question, it can tell me provable or not provable. That would be great. Puts mathematicians out of a job, right? Just one method that can just solve any question that you give it. Right? It doesn't have to be quick, but can it just solve it eventually? So that was his question. So this is the question that Alan Turing decided to take on. So to solve this problem, he conceived of a hypothetical machine, a machine that could do any calculation that a person could do. And he called this machine the computing machine. And the person whose job it would replace was called the computer. And that is the beginning of computer science today. And by the way, he solved the problem in the negative. There isn't just one method that can solve any mathematical question you give it, which is good for me as a mathematician. And he did all this at the age of 22. 